If you have a business, you need a website. What's the best way to get a website up and running? Choose a website hosting company that makes it simple, like Pair Networks. Pair has over 20 years of experience managing the entire digital ecosystem for thousands of online businesses all around the world. Pair makes it easy for you with do-it-yourself website building tools and features, including simple drag and drop page design. And they have guaranteed US-based support technicians ready to help you whenever you need it, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Right now, when you sign up with Pair Networks, you'll receive one free month of web hosting. See for yourself how easy it is to build your website for free. Visit pair.com slash free to get your first month of website hosting for free by using the code QUICKSTART. That's pair.com, P-A-I-R, slash free, promo code Q-U-I-C-K-S-T-A-R-T to get started today. We are, we are, we are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. The Oracle Network. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stangle. Hello. Hi. How are you? I am tired. Same. I need way more coffee than is currently in my body. There is zero coffee in my body, and it's not good. It's not good. No, and you're also still kind of jet-lagged, so... I'm jet-lagged and sunburnt, so, like, I feel like a raisin, and my innards are a raisin. (laughs) And I'm just all shrivelly, just trying to survive. <laughs> shrivelly and sleepy, trying to survive. Maddie just got back from a work trip to Hawaii. Kona. Yeah, I went to the island of Kona. And it was very lovely. And the weather was nice. And the people were nice. And it was great. But now I'm back. And the five-hour difference is getting to me. <laughs> And we had long work days during that trip, too. Like, we were working about 12 hours at a time. So that's getting to me, too. So normally we record a lot earlier than this. And Lindsay was very kind. And she was like, if you want to record later in the afternoon, that's fine. I was like, no, I'll be ready. And I woke up and I was like, I'm not ready. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not ready. I'm so sorry. All right. So this is our last week of Joyful January. Oh, man. Is it going to be like fearsome February or something? We're going to jump like straight back into murder. <laughs> oh, man. Are you excited to hear what our last topic of January is about? I am. I'm a little nervous about February now. but <laughs> Well, the first week of February is going to be fairly mild. I'm, I picked okay. a topic for mom for her birthday. You're going to ease into it? So the first two weeks are in honor of our parents. The second week is an episode that dad recommended a few years ago. That one's going to rough you up so oh, no. thanks, thanks dad, dad. <laughs> god <laughs> have you heard about this really horrifying tale that'll make you question humanity you should do it yes and we will and it's gonna ruin you anyway we're gonna be talking about railway madness Ooh, like building of the railways or like no like, like riding like on riding. trains yeah uh-oh it's a trip <laughs> I didn't, I didn't mean so that. So there is, there is such a thing as crazy train. Yeah. <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne was right. <laughs> so many crazy trains. So going off the rails on a crazy train. So information was pulled from the following sources. A 2018 Ian Visits article by Ian Mansfield. A 2017 Atlas Obscura article by Joseph Hayes. 2017 Railway Museum blog post by Karen Baker. 2016 Journal of Victorian Culture article by Amy Milne-Smith. 2011 BBC article by Bruce Robinson, the National Archives of England, and Worldwide Rails article by Joseph. Thanks, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> he did a great job. He just didn't leave his last name, which is cool. It's, want- it's, it's your site. You do what you want. You want to remain anonymous, I get it. You do you, Joseph. There's a lot of Joes. 
and links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. If you've ever taken public transport, you know that people can be kind of strange from time to time. Or always strange from time to time. Yeah, I think we all know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, picture this. England in January of 1865. You're a passenger on a train headed from Carnforth to Liverpool when you suddenly hear the manic laughter of a man. No, 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 no. Is this nighttime or daytime? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Doesn't Doesn't matter. matter. Still terrifying. Then you see him brandishing a gun as he dances along the carriage steps. So these are the steps on the outside of the train. Why? And he's attacking the windows in an attempt to get at you and your travel companion. No. As the train slows to a stop at Lancaster, the man suddenly seems to snap out of whatever psychotic funk had consumed him, and all seems to be well until the train picks up again to proceed to the next stop, when the madness once again takes hold of him. Okay, that would be horrifying. Yeah. It's like, get off the get off the train, dude. <laughs> stop dancing, stop tippy-tapping on the steps. Get yeah. out. So this case of railway madness wasn't an isolated incident in Victorian England. In fact, Something about riding the rails seemed to have a profound effect on one's mental state, but only if you were a man. Yeah. Yeah. So the first operational steam locomotive made its maiden voyage in South Wales in 1804 on the Penny Darren Tramway. I think I said that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. (laughs) This design, created by Richard Trevithick, inspired other famous railway engineers such as Brunel and the Stevensons. In 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railway opened, and by 1830, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway had as well. Between 1845 and 1900, three billion pounds, which would be 370 billion pounds today, was spent to build railways. Dang. So this was like all over the UK. And the UK is relatively small, too. So that's, that's a lot of money. Yeah, compared to America, it is relatively small, but it is still like, I mean, it's It's several countries. Yeah. So by 1850, the railways were carrying over 64 million passengers a year. Dang. And that number rose to 320 million by 1871 on 16,000 miles of track. So within 21 years, it had bumped up to 320 million. Crazy. The rail system modernized much of England, allowing for faster transportation of goods, increased communication, stimulation of coal and iron industries, not to mention the introduction of standardized time. Mm -hmm. Traveling by train became more popular in the 1850s and 60s due to the fact that not only could you travel farther, but the travel time was reduced significantly. There were some, however, that believed that these modern marvels came at a terrifying price, your mental health. The jarring motion of the train was believed to, quote unquote, injure the brain. Ah, just rattle your brain inside your skull. Oh, mm-hmm. no. And unhinge the mind, triggering Great. violent outbursts like the one I shared earlier. That's so funny. The fact that the brain can like hook off and just rattle inside your skull. Yeah, just like sloshes around. Kind of like when cats shake their heads really fast and that like oh, watery noise. Oh, louder noise. I hate that noise. I hate it so much. Ooh, that. <laughs> Adding to the noise that a train car made, many felt it could shatter your nerves entirely. Yeah, I bet if you've never heard anything quite like it, it could be pretty shocking. Yeah. The 1860s and 1870s are when reports started to come out of people behaving strangely while traveling via rail. People who were known to be quite calm in their day-to-day lives would suddenly start to behave in ways that clashed violently with the social norms of the time. An example of this was reported in the Wrexham Advertiser in 1869, when a Scottish aristocrat, quote, with sandy whiskers and flowing hair, end quote, (laughs) suddenly stripped naked after boarding the train and proceeded to lean out the window to rant and rave at nothing in particular. This man from the ruling class of Falkirk was later taken from the train, given clothes, and seemed to regain his senses as if nothing had ever happened. That's bananas. Mm -hmm. Cultural historian Professor Amy Milne Smith at Wilfrid Laurier University noted that, quote, railway madmen would have all likely been seen as suffering mania, end quote. 
At the time, medical professionals everywhere were scrambling to uncover how they could detect the, quote, latent madness, end quote, that resided in men before it was triggered while traveling via train. So seeing if they could diagnose them before they ever stepped foot on a train. Yep. Okay. They warned that the conditions of modern life and railway travel added undue stress on the already weak British nerves of men of the time. (laughs) (laughs) Buck up, buttercup. The London Review published an article in 1863 that stated the following. Quote, traveling express with madmen is, unfortunately, not an improbable circumstance of real life. And if there be any tendency to mania, the excitement of the rapid transit through the air is the very thing to bring it on. End quote. Crazy. So like it's, the oxygen's coming in too fast? <laughs> You're just getting too much oxygen. It's too fast, too furious. Mm-hmm. We're all family. <laughs> Early passenger trains didn't, shall we say, have the best safety measures in place at the time of their inception and rise in popularity. Any safety features (laughs) at all, ever. They're just iron horse death traps. Pretty much. Those traveling via first or second class would be locked into their carriages for privacy reasons, which meant that if one of your travel companions suddenly snapped, you'd be trapped with them. No. Not only that, but there was no way to call for help if this sort of event happened. Oh, okay. That sounds great. Yep. The Saturday Review described these early train carriages in their July 1864 edition. Quote, A prison where associates may be forced upon a man without any choice of his own, of whose character and antecedents he knows nothing, and one for aught he can tell may be assassins or lunatics. No seclusion from the outer world can be more absolute while it lasts than that of the English railway traveler, end quote. I don't even know what to say. Yeah. Americans were fascinated by the British habit of, quote, locking people up in a small box, end quote, (laughs) since at this time, American trains were much longer than those being utilized in the UK. In fact, these longer American trains would eventually go on to be the inspiration for the London Underground. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So American trains inspired their subway system. Yep. Less madness, I hope. (laughs) We're trapped underground in a steel box. Underground madness is a little more intense, (laughs) gotta say. I'm king of the rats. (laughs) King of the rats. Fun fact. People didn't understand how railways worked, so it had to be recorded in Dr. Dionysus Lardner's Railway Economy, which can... Can we just stop for a second and appreciate how amazing his name is? Dr. Dionysus? Dionysus Lardner. <laughs> what a name. Dionysus was his first name? Yeah. So he was Dr. Lard. Dr. Dr. Lardner. Lardner. Yeah. But in Damn. this, I'm assuming, article, they had to remind passengers that they had to fight the impulse to just jump from the train carriage if your hat blew off or if you dropped a parcel. Because they're used to traveling in like a horse-drawn coach where you can just jump out and it's fine. <laughs> Oh, God, that would be horrible. Did you see just like this little kid like, I'll get it. It's like, oh! <laughs> Jimmy, no. The earliest iterations of the modern day train were open air carriages, which means oh, that while traveling, cold. you would be exposed to the elements, including precipitation. Mm-hmm. Later on, once enclosed carriages were used, you still had to remain vigilant as there were occasions when the carriage doors weren't locked properly and the passengers literally fell out of the moving trains. What? Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm trying to, like, figure out these scenarios of where people are like, oh, is the door open? Oh, how (laughs) surprised? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Arthur. Can you make sure that the door is properly locked? Sure, Margaret. Whoa! Oh, man. And also, the early iterations of carriages were unlit. So if it was nighttime, you'd just be like oh, in pitch darkness. Oh, man. So you'd be freezing, fighting for your life. <laughs> like In the dark. In and out of the carriage. Cool. No red eyes in, on trains. I yeah, I would hope didn't, not. Didn't recommend it. And it wasn't just the idea that people could just fall out of trains that was terrifying either. It was the fact that there was no standardized system in place for how they operated. 
In some sections of the rail network, the rail gauges, not to mention the length between rails, differed from the rest of the network. Great. This made it so that one couldn't ride the same train for the entirety of their journey. They would need to disembark and board a new train. This was the norm until the concept of break of gauge was introduced, which allowed dual gauge trains to run on the same rail line. Mm -hmm. In fact, it wasn't until the Railway Regulation Act was passed in 1840 that the Office of Road and Rail, who were responsible for the safety and regulations in Great Britain, that railways were required to be inspected prior to them opening and running. The fact that a law had to be passed Mm -hmm. for that to happen is baffling to me. Yep. What? Yeah. Not only that, but many of the railways that were built in the 1830s and 40s were built quickly without any attention to safety or structural integrity. Additionally, knowledge about proper construction of the locomotives themselves was also lacking. Awesome. Not only were irregular rail gauges an issue, but even critical items like the boilers that propelled the locomotives themselves could and did malfunction or exceed max pressure, causing boiler explosions. Fun. Mm-hmm. What if that happened at night? Oh my god. <laughs> you just thought that you you were going into a, a train to hell just yep. directly. To hell. Ozzy Osbourne was right. The cast iron rails also posed a problem. Too light to carry the weight of the train, not to mention prone to cracking, they'd cause derailments. Signaling and other warning systems were few and far between, not to mention that block signaling wasn't introduced until the 1850s. Block signaling prevents more than one train entering the same section or, quote, block at the same time. As you can imagine, blocking signals help prevent train collisions, so they were kind of important. Yeah, kind of a big deal. Fun fact, stopping was also an issue, which is terrifying. Of course it was. The Westinghouse air brake wasn't patented until 1869. Prior to this, the brakes had to be put into effect by each individual car. So you had somebody who was like the brake person? In each car, yeah. Oh... As you can imagine, this prevented conductors from being able to perform a prompt stop, and the likelihood of an accident taking place was pretty high. Oh, man. And it wasn't just the idea that people would suddenly go mad while on a train that created a sense of unease amongst the people of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. It was also the idea that patients who had escaped from any of the numerous asylums across the country could easily use it as a quick way to disappear. Awesome. By 1860, lunatic asylums were located across England following a legislative mandate to provide more public asylums. Yeah, sure. Why not? Everybody's crazy. Let's let's keep them all in there. Yep. Considering the asylums dotted the countryside, they would often be relatively close to the railway. Mm Mm-hmm. Escape attempts could be made at any time, during trips in town, while on long walks, while farming or gardening. Some escapees fled to stations or the railroad tracks themselves after escaping their doctors. Fun. In fact, Punch Magazine published a cartoon in 1845 depicting train tracks leading to an asylum, suggesting that a, quote, railway lunatic asylum, end quote, would need to be erected to deal with the growing number of reports of railway madness. Bananas. The Times reported that in 1864, a former artillery sergeant was being transported via train to an asylum in Devizes, Devize, when as soon as the train started to move, he attempted to jump out the window before violently attacking his keeper. Awesome. After hearing a loud noise as the train drove on, he became startled, thinking he was being shot at. Great. Yeah. In retaliation, he bit and kicked the inspector that was transporting him. A guard in the next compartment heard the commotion and stopped the train before helping the inspector handcuff his charge to prevent any further assaults. They didn't have him handcuffed before? Apparently not. Oh my god. I guess we better cuff you now. What? (laughs) We can't trust you. As we touched on last week, women were traveling more freely during this time. And according to Professor Anna Des... Pato Pulau at the University of Athens, I really hope I said your name right, the stories of men going mad, quote, often heightened the anxiety of travel, end quote. Mm -hmm. I would assume so. Yeah. 
But what's crazy is like men are the least of your worries. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's what it sounds like. A perfect example of this was chronicled in the Huddersfield Chronicle in 1873. A well-traveled woman was taking the express train from London to Cambridge and shared her carriage with four gentlemen. Mm. One of the men struck her as off from the beginning of their journey. And when she tried to chat with him, he interrupted her, trembling and jerking, demanding that she be quiet. It was after this outburst that another of the male passengers handed her a card on which he'd written, quote, That man is quite mad. I have been watching him ever since we started. I am Ew. a doctor. Don't be frightened. We can manage him. He shan't hurt you. End quote. Awesome. It makes me feel <laughs> so great. <laughs> what a cute little note. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, doctor. Another example of women having to be on guard involved two women traveling from Doncaster to York who were terrified by a man in the next compartment who attempted to peep on them via a space in the wall where a lamp used to be. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, that sounds like that would be like a super obvious peep. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Sir, sir. As their journey continued, his behavior escalated. He pushed his hand through the space and later threw a piece of metal on the roof of their carriage. He started knocking and then kicking on the wall that separated him from the women, yelling out for blood. What the fuck? Ten minutes after this, he was on the outside of their carriage, holding onto the window of their compartment and threatening to murder them. Yeah, I'd just push him out. It wasn't until some field laborers were able to frantically signal to the guard on the train that the train was stopped and the women were rescued from their attacker. Yeah, because they were probably locked inside, right? Yeah, they were locked inside. And this was back when there weren't hallways outside of the carriages. So they were just like standalone boxes, basically. So yeah, you had no way of letting anybody know that you were in danger. And it's not like a guard would just be looking on either side of the train to make sure right. there are people on the outside, like creepy gremlins. Right. In the 1860s and 70s, the British railway carriages had no passageway between compartments, like I just said. Mm -hmm. Each compartment was its own separate space, and there was no easy way for passengers to exit their carriage while the train was moving. Passengers would be locked into their carriages at the station platform, and there they would stay until they reached their intended destination. Mm -hmm. Or possibly like another station if they wanted or to disembark. And, yeah. yeah. Regardless, pretty much everyone agreed that something had to be done to protect train passengers from would-be madmen. One overly enthusiastic journalist in 1863 stated the following, and this is messed up. Quote, we demand that a bishop or a privy counselor be slaughtered in a railway carriage for the benefit of this, his country, end quote. What? Yeah. As you can imagine, politicians soon got involved, calling for forms of communications to be set in place between passengers and train guards. In the beginning, railway owners seemed to just turn a blind eye to what was going on, regardless of how many people were demanding that they be held responsible for the attacks that were taking place on their trains. In fact, when the government introduced rules that would offer compensation for people who suffered railway accidents in 1864, the railway owners tried to limit those payments to 100 pounds, mm -hmm. which in today's money would be around 13,000 pounds. According to the Scotsman newspaper, these sorts of attacks were on the rise to the point that they were almost a daily occurrence. Damn. It wasn't just sudden public nudity that would happen. Attacks with knives and other weapons that could and did result in death were also reported in newspapers across the country. In fact, an American traveler wrote to the Times in 1854 saying that he was carrying a loaded revolver while traveling via train when he was in England on the off chance he encountered a madman. Fun. Yep. I mean, I guess like you, you'd want to defend yourself, so it makes sense. Yeah. The Times printed a letter written by a reader in 1864 regarding the public's frustrations with train travel. Quote, it seems from recent and repeated experience that neither numbers nor class can secure a passenger, young or old, strong or feeble, sick or well, man or woman, from peril in an ordinary journey. End quote. Mm. The Manchester Times reported the first railway murder in 1864 in an article titled, quote, A Madman in a Railway Carriage, end quote. Thomas Briggs, a 69-year-old middle-class banker, 
was robbed, beaten, and thrown from a moving railway carriage on the North London Railway on July 9, 1864, that had been traveling from Fenchurch Street to Hackney. Thomas had been traveling in a first-class carriage that was later found soaked in blood. Oh, fine. When his body was discovered and later examined, he'd sustained several serious blows to the head. Ugh. His hat and gold watch with chain were missing. The suspect, Franz Mueller, was still at large in London a month after Thomas's murder and later arrested in New York City by British police after being extradited back to Britain. Interesting. Yeah, where he was tried and publicly hanged. So at least Thomas received justice after his death. Yeah. The July 13, 1864 edition of the Daily Telegraph noted of this senseless crime, quote, There is one general feeling which this dark crime has excited among the population. There must be an end put to the absolute imprisonment which railway travelers endure, end quote. The Times published an article in August 1864 about a burly sailor who became enraged and started to flail about before attempting to climb out the window of the carriage he was in while on an express train from King's Cross to Peterborough with his wife. They noted, quote, he started to roar and swear with increasing violence for some time and then made an attempt to throw himself out of the window. He threw his arms and part of his body out of the window and had just succeeded in placing one of his legs out when the other occupants of the carriage, who had been endeavoring to keep him back, succeeded in dragging him from the window, end quote. Damn. It took four people to restrain and bind him to his seat for the remainder of their two-hour journey. No. That sounds awful. Not only that, but upon his release, he charged and attacked those that had subdued him, accusing them of theft. It took several railway officials and the police to overcome and ultimately arrest him. To be fair, even though he appeared to be suffering from railway madness, it was later determined that he was possibly suffering from delirium tremens. Mm. This diagnosis has been around since 1813 and is either the result of an alcoholic binge or a sudden withdrawal of alcohol. Yep. There's a beer that called delirium tremens. Symptoms include a morbid fixation on particular acts or ideas, such as the sailor's insistence that the other passengers were trying to rob him. Mm -hmm. Doctors in the Victorian era also believed that excessive alcohol consumption was one of the leading causes of insanity. Yeah, definitely some paranoia. Especially if, it, if trains were as scary as they were, they're made out to be. Mm -hmm. Other stories include one in Bedford, where a lunatic attacked his keeper unexpectedly while traveling via train in a brutal assault. While the train was in motion, the lunatic removed a razor from his pocket that he'd hidden on his person before attempting to slit his own throat. Jeez. When his keeper attempted to prevent him from doing it, he suddenly became the target. Mm-hmm. According to the Leicester Chronicle, when the train arrived at the station, guards arrived to discover both men covered in blood, with the keeper losing a thumb during his struggle to prevent oh. his charge from taking his own life. That's awful. Yeah. An interesting point that I came across in my research was the idea that railways somehow heightened men's fears of train travel, challenging their masculinity. Uh-oh. Any men who went into fits of hysterics when traveling via train would feel a profound sense of shame at their actions afterwards. Mm -hmm. Their behavior viewed as something that women would be more likely to experience, not quote-unquote manly men. Yeah. Men feared that by traveling via train, they may lose control of their actions, kind of like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation. Yeah. There were reports of people even climbing out of their small compartments and walking along the narrow ledge on the outside of the moving train, which traveled anywhere from 25 to 60 miles per hour, <sighs> to attempt to get into the next compartment. No, no. Another report was that of a young man who ran along the footboard of the train once it departed the station, going about smashing windows before attacking an elderly man. He even attempted to take his own life before he was arrested and later punished. Awesome. I'm going to give a short trigger warning. This next section is going to discuss acts of suicide. Okay. So if you need to skip ahead, please do so. It's fairly short, but I just wanted to let you know. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be surprising that trains became targets for those seeking to complete suicide. In the Victorian era, the act of suicide was viewed as the ultimate loss of control, a failure of the mind, and the will of the spirit. 
the 1860s medical community depicted the act of suicide as a result of despair or mental illness, and it wasn't long before a growing number of suicidal patients started getting admitted to asylums around the country. Mm -hmm. The idea of throwing oneself in front of a moving train started to spread. Thus, the railway became a popular site for completing suicide. Preventing or even saving someone from completing suicide in this way was dangerous at best, deadly at worst. Yeah. Especially if, if every train car had to break, mm -hmm. it'd be near impossible to stop. Yep. In 1878, railway inspector Frederick Croft saved a suicidal woman from an oncoming train, but lost his life in the process. The Penny Illustrated paper framed the story as a great tragedy, a noble and chivalrous railway employee doing his duty to rescue a woman who'd thrown herself on the tracks. It should be noted that the only instance of railway madness that involve women have to do with the act of suicide. Interesting. That's the end of our trigger warning. There will be no more mentions of suicide. Okay. Victorian railways stipulated in their 1864 bylaws that any quote-unquote insane persons should be confined, quote, in a compartment by themselves, end quote. Oh, that'll help. Yeah. Sure. As you can imagine, putting this sort of thing into practice caused a number of problems. Mm-hmm. The Board of Trade called on railway companies to act, quote, to allay the sense of insecurity at present prevailing among railway passengers, end quote, in 1864. And by 1868, the Regulation of Railways Act introduced provisions that every railway company supplies some form of communication between the guards and the passengers for every train that traveled more than 20 miles in between stops. However, this bill was stalled out for several years. Mm. Almost all solutions that were brought forth to fix the issue were immediately rejected as infringing upon people's personal space. Awesome. One example of this is what was called Mueller's lights, which were essentially windows within the carriages designed to allow people in other carriages to look inside. That's a little creepy. If this name sounds familiar, it should. This was the man who was convicted of committing the first railway murder. Yeah. Many companies, such as the Southwestern Railway, did install these portholes, if you will, inside each coach, but there was a problem. Since people could suddenly look into your carriage whenever they wanted, there were concerns over peeping toms. Or stealing. Yeah. I can also imagine, like, men abusing it and doing, like, lewd gestures towards women in the other carriages mm -hmm. and stuff. The Leeds Mercury paper wrote that one reason these seemingly obvious and simple safety measures weren't being taken was because it would mean that people would be giving up their privacy in order to be safe. Victorian ideals were that privacy equals security, even though it was that very privacy that was in this case the root of the issue. Right. Communication systems via cable were proposed to be used in case of an emergency, but the logistics of getting this sort of system to work quickly resulted in the idea being thrown out. So it was kind of like this, the whole, if you're trying to get the bus to stop type of method, where you'd have yeah. some sort of cable you could pull down. Yeah. One method that was introduced was the alarm chain, which would warn guards if there was a problem. However, there did end up being some problems with this. An example of this is the story of a child that was repeatedly pulling the cord while in the toilet. Oh, no. Once the door was forced open, the guard was surprised to find the distraught youngster trying to figure out why pulling what he believed to be the toilet chain wasn't flushing the toilet. Oh, no. Poor baby. Going back to the whole idea of people having no idea how the hell trains worked, one woman thought it was a fantastic idea to pull the cord in an effort to stop the train so she could disembark and take a closer look at a rather nice house for rent that they'd just passed. God. You know, because they're on her time, not anybody else's. Yep. Awesome. Passengers would frequently also pull the chains to control the gas lighting or the heating by mistake instead of pulling the actual alarm cord. Awesome. It wasn't until 1899 that everyone, the government, engineers, railway companies, were able to agree on one safety measure, emergency brakes. Finally. What, what year was this again? 1899. Fun. <laughs> Just in time. Congratulations, everybody. We did it. <laughs> Good job. Slow clap. Wow. Newspaper articles chronicling the panic tended to follow a distinct pattern, as noted by Professor Amy Milne-Smith in her article, Shattered Minds. Quote, the first includes stories of established lunatics' contact with the railway. Lunatics escape their keepers both in transit and from within the asylum, and such stories emphasize the idea that the mad could be anywhere. 
The second section mm-hmm. focuses on the most common reports of railway madmen, men suddenly taken with madness in the midst of an ordinary journey. These reports focused on how, in an instant, a seemingly harmless passenger could transform into a crazed and violent psychotic. Such terrifying and sudden attacks exemplified the perceived fragile boundary between madness and sanity. Finally, the article concludes by examining the calls for policy reform that often frame these stories. Unproductive demands for greater railway safety measures and the inability of the asylums to live up to the promise of cure or prevention helped to sustain the panic, end quote. But ultimately, what was causing this issue? Many believe that the noise and unpredictable nature of trains, not to mention the vibrations, caused anxiety and triggered symptoms that today we would associate with post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. I mean, especially with the artillery guy. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. I was like, those are noises he's familiar with, but not in that kind of setting. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. They termed this new medical condition the railway spine and described it as a form of paralysis triggered by a repressed terror of the railway accident. Because keep in mind, like, railway accidents were still a huge thing right now. Yeah. Of this new condition, one doctor wrote, quote, Railway collisions, their sudden occurrence, the dramatic setting, association of large numbers of the injured, the social prominence of many victims, the wide publication of newspaper reports, and the ground importance of the financial claim created a lurid mental picture in the mind of the injured and indirectly affected the general public in such as way as to provide a fertile soil for nervous disturbance, end quote. Yeah, that makes sense. In regards to the anxiety that many felt when riding on trains, Professor Amy Milne Smith wrote, quote, Not only might you be attacked by a madman on a railway journey, you might become one. End quote. Mm-hmm. The medical community seemed to widely accept the idea that travel by rail was connected to nervous disorders. Mm-hmm. In fact, in 1862, The Lancet published a series of articles about the dangers of railway travel to public health. This leading medical journal stated that traveling by train could cause any number of the following to the unsuspecting passenger. Fatigue, hemorrhoids, or even paralysis. Hemorrhoids? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's something I wasn't expecting. Right? It was believed that a man with underlying mental anxieties or a predisposition to insanity would have these mania triggered by train travel. Author Alfred Haviland stated, quote, No one can estimate the amount of disease that has been revealed, we will not say developed, on the platform or in the railway carriage, end quote. Hmm. Fun fact, Charles Dickens, the famous author, had a hard time traveling by train after being involved in a train accident in Staplehurst in 1865. Well, that makes sense. I can't imagine how traumatizing a train accident would be during that time. Yeah. Years later, his children would recall that when traveling via rail with their father following his accident, quote, as soon as it went across the points, he would grab hold of the chair and look straight at the floor. He would sweat and tremble, end quote. That's so sad. Yeah. Just as suddenly as it started, reports of train madness and railway madmen seemed to disappear from the news. One of the last reported incidents of railway madness took place in 1894, when a naked person began full-on assaulting the train and its passengers by disabling communications and roaming around the train sans clothes. It ended all right, though. (laughs) The attacker was beaten into submission with the pointy end of an umbrella. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Thankfully for him, not a hat pin. Yeah. Jeez. And that is the tale of railway madness. Wow. Now I'm curious as to see if something was similar during modern flight travel too. I bet I bet they had similar growing pains. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. With all the noises and turbulence and Well, I can't imagine the idea of just being like, Yeah, I'm gonna get into this thing that we hope works and just fly. Right. <laughs> And hope that I don't die. Yep. Hi, I'm Anna Thomas. And let me tell you about my podcast, Apple for the Teacher. It sure sounds like it's about reading, writing and arithmetic. But don't let the title fool you. I'm a teacher from Australia and tell true crime stories associated with schools, which go far beyond shootings and teacher sexual misconduct. If you're like me, you may feel that you know enough about some high-profile cases, such as Ted Bundy and the Zodiac Killer. 
Apple for the Teacher presents lesser known stories such as Albino student murder in Africa, schoolgirl sexual slavery in Libya, a school suicide bombing in Pakistan, a student murdered and buried in his school in India, a teacher beheaded in France, Polish teachers executed by the Nazis, just to name a few. But you'll also find school-based tragedies such as a school bus stranded in a snowstorm, a school wiped out by a landslide, the drowning of students in a sinking ship. It can be described as a mixed bag of diverse stories. So if you're looking for something a little different in the true crime genre, then give it a listen. And I hope you can join me soon. But until then, remember to be a good apple. And this week's podcast plug is the Apple for Teacher podcast. Uh, True crime stories in the school system, like the good apples and the bad apples. Mm -hmm. Murder, suicide, hijacking, sexual misconduct, lawsuits, spying, disappearances, kidnapping, and bullying in the school system. That's a lot. But just because you find one bad apple doesn't mean you should give up on the whole tree. So the good apples will be celebrated as well. Nice. Anna Thomas, who is an Australian teacher and your host, goes through each week stories of good apples and bad apples. Nice. I've listened to her podcast. The episodes are fairly short, so it's easy Mm -hmm. to binge them. And she does a really good job kind of talking about stories kind of all over the world, not just, as you would imagine, stories that take place in the U.S. Right. So it's also kind of interesting to hear stories from, you know, like Australia and other countries. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you're interested in learning more about kind of incidents that happen in kind of schools around the country and around the world, I suggest you give it a listen. It's really well done. Awesome. And this week's listener question comes from our friend Dustin over at Stan Man Stories Presents. Mm -hmm. And he wants to know, which criminal do you think got off too easy? Well, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Somebody who was convicted or somebody who wasn't? (laughs) Because the people who weren't got off (laughs) way too easy. Yeah. Man, it's hard to think. I think whoever was Jack the Riffber got off too easy. Mm-hmm. See, it got away with it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What 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 comes to mind for you? I think of the man who murdered Fanny Adams. Oh, yeah. I feel like he got off too easy because what he did to her was awful. Yeah. And if you don't know what we're talking about, it's an earlier episode and it's a brutal murder of a child. Yeah. That was the first one that came to mind when I thought about it. I feel like... Mm-hmm. He deserved to suffer a lot more for that. Yeah. On that note, what's something good you'd like to share? (laughs) Oh, man. So something good. So this past week, I was traveling for work. And because of all the regulations and with COVID and trying to coordinate, I did not take Willie with me to Kona, Hawaii. And it sucked. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I really missed him. But he did well at our parents' house. He... Almost caught two squirrels. Nice. Apparently, he became the unofficial greeter of their job, <laughs> and he would go. He would go with them to work in the morning, and then when they would go home for lunch, he'd stay and take like a nap. Mm-hmm. Which sounds like the perfect job. Yeah, right. <laughs> when we reunited, when we were able to like see each other on Saturday, that was like the, a perfect moment. It was yeah. really nice and sweet, and he hasn't left my side since, and it's been really nice. Uh-huh. What about you? What's something good? I found out this past week that in June, the second week of June, unless it gets canceled for some reason, knock on wood, mm. I'll be attending a conference in New Orleans. Nice. So, and I've never been to New Orleans, so I'm very excited to go. The conference is taking place in a hotel where we'll be staying, but it's mm-hmm. also, and it's on Canal Street and it's really close mm. to Bourbon Street. So I'm very excited. I'm hoping I can have control over when I fly in. We have like the last day is Friday and we're only there until like lunchtime. Mm -hmm. So then hopefully I'll have some time to kind of explore down there a little bit. Beware of the slushies. At least from the map, it looks like we're within walking distance of the Museum of Death. Okay. Which I kind of want to check out. Mm -hmm. Our friend Alex over at Weird Distractions Podcasts said that she went there when she was in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And she said it's not nearly as scary as they painted out to be. Like they put on their website a disclaimer like you might faint if you go. Oh, no. I went to the Museum of Death in California and it's not it's not scary. It's sobering. Yeah. So I'm just going to the New Orleans equivalent of where you went. Mm hmm. 
I really want to go. I'm excited to experience beignets for the first time. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be really cool. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yay. Shall we? We shall. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Instagram at Facebook at Yield Crime Podcast. Mm-hmm. You can also find us on YouTube. Please subscribe so we can have a personalized YouTube channel URL. That'd be awesome. That's awesome. Subscribe. Subscribe. If you'd like to send us something in the mail, you can do so to our P.O. Box, which is Yield mm-hmm. Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota, 55092. We also have it listed in the show notes if you don't want to keep track of that right now. Yep. <laughs> You can email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We're always on the hunt for questions, listener questions. Mm-hmm. And if you have a particular story idea where you're like, I really want to hear somebody cover this older case, please send it our way. And if you'd like to support the show, but you can't do so financially, a great way to do that is by leaving a five-star rating and review. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, and you can also leave a rating on Spotify. This week's review comes from Podchaser, and that's from our friend Lauren over at the Dear Diary Keep Out podcast, which is a really fun podcast. It sounds like a really fun podcast. She's British. And she kept like all her diaries from when she was in like, I think late elementary school through like middle school. And she reads entries to her husband who's from America. That's so funny. So it's really funny listening to her show because she'll have to like explain certain things to him that like, obviously we don't know about in America Mm -hmm. or haven't done in America. So it's interesting. I highly suggest you listen to our podcast. But anyway, she left us a five-star review that said, genuinely such fun to listen to. The hosts have such great energy and vibe off each other so well. You feel like you're part of it and in the room with them. The stories are very well researched and wonderfully told. Love it. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. If you're able to support us financially and would like to do so, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee for a one-time donation. You can also support us by joining our Patreon. If you want to wrap some of our merch, head on over to our Redbubble store. I realize I haven't included a link to it anywhere because I didn't have anything. I'm still working on transitioning stuff over. I promise (laughs) I will have stuff (laughs) over there eventually. Our T Public link still works. Our T Public store is still operational and up. So if you want to go to T Public instead, you can do so. Nice. I will do a huge announcement when Redbubble is fully populated. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.